Welcome to our show this evening. My name is Tom Looney. And Shivani Vukla joining you again for another hour of Irish television. On tonight's show we have music, lots of music from folk, ballads and traditional everything you want in Irish music. And not only that, Tom? Yes, also our usual news and sports with Mike Shevlin and Eamon Kelly and our special feature of the week. But now to start off the evening we have Pat Woods and a number for us. We're going to liven this up, we're going to lift the roof maybe about three or four inches. I want you all to clap. If you have a cigarette in your hand, don't because you could burn yourself. It's a song about the elusive Blarney Storm. As I walked out through Bandon one fine morning last July, I met a pretty collie. Come on, she smiled as she went by. Says I, I am a stranger in this world, I am alone. Can anybody tell me we'll find the Blarney Stone? She, she, there's a Blarney Stone in Kerry, there's a Blarney Stone in Clare, there's a Blarney Stone in Wicklow, there's one in Old Kildare, there's a Blarney Stone in Dublin Town and a big one in Athlone. But there's devil a place in Ireland that you'll find the Blarney Stone. She, she, I know you come from Galway, I can tell it by your brogue. Sure, I never met a Galway man that wasn't a bit of a rope. But since you are a stranger with a Shannon River clothes, the the only Blarney stone you'll find is underneath me. No, she, she, there's a Blarney stone in Kerry. There's a Blarney stone in Clare. There's a Blarney stone in Wicklow. There's one in Old Kildare. There's a Blarney stone in Dublin town and a big one in Athlone. But there's devil a place in Ireland that you'll find the Blarney stone. Her Irish smile had brought. She winked her roguish eye. My heart had started thumping. I thought I'd surely die. And I held her in my arms. And she never gave a groan. And I kissed the bloom in Blarney at the band in Blarney Stone. She, she, there's a Blarney Stone in Kerry. There's a Blarney Stone in Clare. There's a Blarney Stone in Wicklow. There's one in Old Kildare. There's a Blarney Stone in Dublin Town and a big one in Athlone. But there's devil a place in Ireland and you'll find the Blarney Stone. Hey! That was Pat Woods, one of the regular musical contributors here on the show. Now, as you've probably realised, this Wednesday the Furies and Davy Arthur are playing at the Abbey. There may still be a chance to get one or two tickets that are left. And uh, here's some footage that we filmed of the Barley Corn, another group who visited the Abbey during the summer. <laughs> Thank you. 
welcome back. One of the most enjoyable ways to listen to good traditional Irish music is at the session. And uh, over the past weeks, we've had many sessions here at the Abbey. And here is a group now for you playing in the session. Now it's time for news and sports with Eamon Kelly and Mike Shevlin. And of course the big local news this week was the fashion show at the Irish American Heritage Centre. This was an incredible event, we really enjoyed it immensely and some very, very beautiful clothes were modelled by the volunteers at the Heritage Centre. The clothes were provided by Mary Dugan from Erin Island Clark Street and believe me that store is well worth a visit if you're into haute couture Irish style. Here's Mike Shevlin. Good evening, this is Eamon Kelly with the weekly review of Irish sports being brought to you by Craigan Federal Savings. Last Monday night our complete sports report concentrated on the replay of the All-Ireland Football Final in which Meade defeated Cork by 1 point, 13 points to 12. 
Given that tonight's show was taped last Thursday, we are unable to report on what could be described as a rather light weekend in Irish sports. In fact, last week's All-Ireland Final still remains a general subject of discussion in sports circles around Ireland. Many of the football experts were presenting their own analysis on the All-Ireland Champions Mead, considering, considered to be very lucky to survive the first game. They managed to win the replay with only 14 players for 63 and a half minutes of the 70-minute game. Many reports have been written about the game since we talked about it last Sunday night, last Monday night, we should say. All reports concur that the dismissal of Jerry McEntee after only six and a half minutes of play for a nasty foul on Cork's Niall Cullahan was the turning point in the game. The general discussion was that the sending off of McEntee res resulted in Meade consolidating their depleted forces into an inspired group to defend their title at all costs, and this placed Cork in a confused state in terms of not knowing how to deploy the extra man. In a game that will not be remembered for sportsmanship, the Irish Independent newspaper had this to say about the 1988 football final. We will not remember this final for the standard of football. We will remember the competitiveness, meet stubborn resistance of Cork's barrage, and also remembered will be the far too many stoppages because of far too many fouls. As for McEntee's departure, the newspaper went on to say the extra man should have been should have made a telling difference. It did to Meade's advantage. They did not deploy the extra man, Tony Davis, to a useful role. Also, Cork did not learn from the drawn game, if you don't score, you don't win. Many of the Cork players interviewed after the game all agreed that while they missed the boat in the drawn game, they failed to use the extra man to their best advantage. As for the referee's action in dismissing McEntee after six and a half minutes, there was general agreement in the press with the decision. In fact, referee Tom Sugru of Kerry received high standards for his handling of the game, which at times threatened to get out of control. As we close the book on the 1988 football and hurling championship season, many may want to predict the outcome of the 1989 campaign. No doubt Galway hurlers and Mead footballers will be expected to make a strong bid in 1989 to capture their respective All-Ireland titles for the third cons consecutive year. Incidentally, on last week's show, I incorrectly made a reference to Cork instead of Mead being contestants for a third football title in a row in 1989. My apologies to all you Mead fans out there, it was just a slip of the tongue. In other GAA news, Burris Lee were surprisingly defeated by Lockmore in the Tipperary Hurling Championship final replay at Thurless last week. In contrast to the drawn game, this was a thrilling contest in which Lockmore gained a two-point victory with a spectacular goal with less than two minutes remaining in the game. The curtain raiser to the senior football final last week was the junior All-Ireland football final. This was a very poor, disappointing game before the large All-Ireland Day attendance, which Meade defeated London by the score of one goal and ten points to three points. So much for GAA games, and now to cycling. Sean Kelly of Ireland finished third to Holland's Peter Peters in the Paris Tour 285km Classic last Sunday. In athletics, Ireland's Tommy Hughes won the Melbourne Australia Marathon last Sunday, while in Tokyo, Marcus O'Sullivan finished fourth behind American Steve Scott in the 1500 meter special in the international meet there last week. And that's it for sports this weekend. And until next Monday at the same time, this is Eamon Kelly bidding you all a very good evening. Well, during the past uh, few months, we've had Shea Duffin, and he performed here at the Abbey doing Brendan Behan and the Confessions of an Irish Rebel. And now here is Shea doing Mr. Dooley, which is appropriate this election year. Now, I think the vice presidency is a fine job. Any man could put in four good years down in the lovely city of Washington if he was a good sleeper. <laughs> The work is minimal, actually all the work is done during the campaign out around the fresh air all around the country, either yelling from the back car of a train in Iowa, or appearing at a church social down in Texas in between a cornet solo and a glee club. Now he must be good at the rapper tea, 
sweet to the ladies, a uh, fair boxer, a uh, fair man at digging up a finance committee, good man at dodging bricks, and let me see now if he's, uh, if he's a Republican campaign in Boston, a good sprinter. <laughs> Now, if he has all of these qualities, he may or may not get the job. Because after the election, uh, the people call in the president and they hand him the new office. Now, they notify the new vice president by an advertisement in the newspaper. <laughs> well, the gentleman with the dark hair, the hazel eyes, the white vest and the black coat, who was nominated as vice president at the convention, if he will phone headquarters, he will hear something to his advantage. <laughs> so he buys a couple of railway tickets and he and the wife hop off down to the lovely city of Washington <laughs> where they rent a room rooted to their, suited to their station overlooking the Chinese laundry overlooking the railway yards you see if the president has to live where he's put the vice president can live where he chooses providing the neighbours are not too particular <laughs> Now it's the duty of the Vice President to call upon the White House every morning and to inquire as to the President's health. And when he's told that the President never felt better, he gives three cheers and goes away with a heavy heart. Now he gets personally involved with the President because if it's raining at all, if it's raining at all, he will rush over to the White House and plead with the President not to go out without wearing his rubbers. And he'll, he'll even have Mrs. Vice President knit the President a shawl to protect him from the night air. Now, <laughs> and if he hears at all that the President has a bit of a temperature, he'll be on the phone to the doctor all night saying, I hear our noble President is unwell. Is there anything I can do for him? Like maybe drawing his salary. <laughs> or appointing the new postmaster to Indianapolis. <laughs> now, it's because of the Vice President that most of our Presidents have enjoyed such rugged health. Because after the President, you see, it's the duty of the Vice President to protect the President. But after the President sizes up the Vice President, he concludes that it would be better for the country if he stayed alive a few years longer. <laughs> So he says to the Vice President, George, every time I see you I feel ten years younger. Bully, bully, bully. <laughs> and of course George says, Ah, oh, sir, them kind words brings tears to my eyes. <laughs> Only this morning the good wife was saying to me, How happy we are in our little flat. Now, the Vice President, he's not even called upon to make a decision. All his grateful country asks from the man that they've elevated to this noble position on the tour of a boot is that he keeps his opinions to himself. That's a fun piece. There's nothing like a bartender to tell you exactly what's going on in the world of politics. They can probably tell you who's going to win the election as well. Well, now our special this week has to do with fishing in Ireland, and this is a big plus for all the Mayo men because this was filmed off the coast of Mayo on and off the coast of Ackle Island. And uh, it's not really to do with your regular trout, salmon, or herring fishing. This is shark fishing. Believe me, the shark are big out there. Here's the special. Kim Bay is the centre of our story. It's a secluded cove in the west of the island, and from about mid-April until the end of May each spring, huge basking sharks come close inshore. For many years they've been hunted for their liver oil, and until recently made an important contribution to the local economy. There was never any bay in any part of Ireland that I could recall, or even in Scotland or anywhere, that there was more money came out of because it was a sheltered bay and it was only the southeast wind that bothered you and they were fishing here when you couldn't fish any other place there was some of the fishermen here like those big families and they reared their whole families on the fishing out of here there'd been nobody ever drowned in Kim isn't that a peculiar thing you could nearly try to drown yourself here and you wouldn't be drowned and uh, it, rumor has it that uh, when St. Patrick came to Crow Patrick, that's the, you can't see it today from the haze, but it lies out there. And it, it's nearly always misted on, 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 on Crow Patrick. But when the, the mist lifted anyway, and on the top, and the first place they caught his eye was Tim Bay, looking directly northwest. So he blessed this bay and said that nobody would ever be drowned in it. There was men come back from California, there was men come back from Alaska. 
there was uh, men come back from America, all over America, and they started fishing here. In the year 54, it may well be remembered when 50 shark fishermen landed in Kem. From Clockmore, I kill bag, from Maskell and Sawyer, and all over Rachel came some of these men. The crews had assembled and the gear it was ready. The weather was fair, we were living in hope. For to get a good station to tie up a net on, then put on our oilskins and hang on a rope. The strength of the basking shark is unbelievable. But to give you an idea, I remember on one occasion where um, we harpooned a shark, as distinct from the netting that we sp we're doing now, and we attached two barrels, uh, two of these 45-gallon barrels, and that shark simply submerged, having had the harpoon in them, plus the two barrels, and that was the last we saw of them. A good-sized shark retain a boy in his mouth, but they're entirely harmless so far as the, the association that we have with sharks. The basking shark is a true fish in contrast to the large mammals such as the whales and the porpoises, and as such it extracts oxygen from the water through gills, and these are particularly highly developed in the basking shark. There are five enormous gill slits which almost seem to divide the head from the rest of the body and the reason for this is that this is the feeding mechanism of the basking shark despite its large size it only feeds on microscopic plankton it, uh, the largest food particles it takes in are about one or two millimeters in size and it, fil uh, and it feeds simply by filtering vast volumes of water uh, when the mouth is open, it has a jaw gape of over a meter. The lower jaw drops right down, the nose tends to bend upwards, and these gill slits open right up into a sort of an enormous Chinese lantern effect. And the adult shark goes for about 1,500 tons of water per hour through that. And every hour, the fish needs to extract about two kilograms of food. Now all this feeding apparatus is really quite delicate. There are uh, tiny uh, gill rakers which do the filtering and indeed these fish apparently stop feeding in the winter when there's insufficient uh, food in the water to maintain this two kilograms per hour requirement. The gill rakers fall off and these uh, sharks apparently go into some sort of hibernation. One of the key characteristics of the shark family is multiple rows of sharp teeth. The basking shark does have these teeth, but they're only one or two millimeters high, so really the jaws of the basking shark are just like rough sandpaper. The only thing that we really ever were scared of was the tail. As you can imagine, the tail of a basking shark, when he really thrashed the water, was something he would stave in, in a boat with a keel on it. Uh, tourists very often say, well, why are you using such archaic craft as a curra, which is going back over the centuries? Well, there's method in our madness for the simple reason that with the curra, if a shark hits it, this, it will give and will skim over the waves, whereas if, the, if you had a solid base boat, uh, it would cave in. I have been in a curra where a shark uh, came up underneath, and then you, you're, that was another danger point, of course, of capsizing. But in actual fact, uh, although the, the, it's uh, going on now for nearly 40 years, uh, we've only had one instance that I can remember of a crew actually being tossed out of a, out of a curra into the water by a shark coming up under the, under the curra and lifting it bodily. A book of dirt for the water. Let's put this on now. Yeah. The building of Karaks 
the sleek canvas-covered boats, peculiar to the west of Ireland, is a specialized skill kept alive in the island by a handful of craftsmen, like retired shark fisherman Charlie Tom O'Malley. Last a generation of traditional Corrock builders, Charlie Tom is anxious to pass on his knowledge and still an essential fishing boat for these waters. Oh, we're there. Put a few more in, yeah? Yeah. Huh? Alright. Danny's is going on fire too, too. Yeah? Yeah, Danny's yoke is going on fire too. I think it's time to put them in now, Charlie. Huh? Don't put them in now. All right. Show them all the way back to the fair end. All right, come on, Mike. You need to put the straw in there on top. They're okay there now. Corrocks are built from the inside out, starting with the ribs. Oak laths are placed in a top of boiling water to make them pliable enough to be bent into a semicircular shape. These form the skeleton over which deal planks are nailed. I think they're ready now, Charlie. particular craftsman can usually be recognized. Two coats of hot tar are applied to the upturned hull. The first saturates the fabric and binds it to the wood. The second coat provides a shiny black waterproof skin. Because of its natural buoyancy and lightweight construction, a korok can ship water to the gunnels without sinking while its flexible construction enables it to take the odd knock without sustaining permanent damage. Hence its suitability for shark hunting. You want me to wash the boots before they go in, Sean? No, no. No, she's... All right. We've seen enough. She I know what... Light, what? what? Ah. Don't let her go without you. She... Up she went well quick. She is. Up for her, Mira. <laughs> Ah, oh. oh, there you are. Huh? That's a good start that's for a new cutter. She, she seems to be handy with the wind anyway. Oh, the life jacket, yeah? Life yeah. Oh, well equipped. When the towering is completed, Watch the cutter is ready for sea. Oh, An experienced oarsman, Michael Guilty, tests well, its qualities. Well, we're getting back in. Huh? 
Let me look at your pots when I'm over here. Yeah, 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 you can check them out. That's oh, not bad, no, not bad. But if we kill now, she'd be sound shot. Yeah. As well as being indispensable for shark hunting, the Korok is an ideal boat for salmon fishing. And with shark catches dwindling, this now provides the mainstay of the crew's income. Hello, I'm Breach Looney, here this evening to share with you the upcoming events at the Irish American Heritage Centre. This centre is not just a cultural centre, it's a place for you to come and meet people and work with people. Why not book your next party at the Irish Centre? For information, call 282-7035. Well, we'd like to thank all you volunteers that helped to make it such a success yesterday at the fashion show. We will be showing you footage of this over the next few weeks, so watch out for it. Now here is Patrick Street with a number. So we can start now. I'm gonna play three jigs. Here's the first one. <laughs> Thank you. 
Once again, we're at the end of another show. Thank you for tuning in. And at the same time next week at 7 o'clock, uh, we'd like to close out the show tonight with a real good traditional number. And Siobhan, I think you have something good for us too. Yeah, I'd just like to tell people that if they can't wait till next Monday, you can catch our repeat on Sunday for more of the same and maybe even something different. Until then, we'll see you this Wednesday at the Abbey with the Fury Brothers and Davy Arthur. Good night. Good night.
this next song I would like to do for uh, any viewers looking in here from Cork. This is a Cork song, and it's a lovely one called The Banks of the Lee. So, this is for all the Cork people here. When two lovers meet down beneath the green bower When two lovers meet down beneath the green tree When Mary, lovely Mary, declared unto her darling You've stolen my poor heart on the banks of the lake I loved her so sincerely, so truly and so dearly There's no one in this wide world I love more than she Every brush and every bower, every wild Irish flower Reminds me of my Mary on the banks of the lake Love on the moorlands for me. But little was our notion as we wandered o'er the ocean. We'd be forever parted from the banks of the lake. For I loved her so sincerely, so truly, and so dearly. There's no one in this wide world I love more than she Every brush and every bower, every wild Irish flower Reminds me of my Mary in the banks of the lake Well I pick for her some roses, some wild Irish roses I pick for her some roses, the fairest ever seen And I lay them on the grave of my dear darling Mary In that silent little churchyard where she sleeps neat and clay So truly and so dearly There's no one in this white world I love more than she Every brush and every bower Every wild Irish flower Reminds me of my Mary On the banks of 